Good evening, everyone. We're, welcome to our first meeting of the 2019 year of New York ARSC's uh, meetings here at CCNY. And tonight we have, as always, he was here last year, Matt Barton from the Library of Congress, who's going to do a terrific program, and it's entitled So Rare, The Last Days of Jimmy Dorsey. Let me give you a little history of what's going to happen here. Recorded sound curator at the Library of Congress and past president of ARSC, and you recovering survived. Recovering president. Recovering president. Yeah, that's right. It's recovering when you're, pa when you're recently passed, you're recovering. Yeah. Matthew Barton will tell the story of this tune, recorded at Dorsey's last session on November 11th, 1956, only two weeks before his death, up, uh, death of his brother Tommy. It subsequently became an unlikely hit in the twilight of Jimmy's life as he struggled through his last year. This presentation will look at its chart run in depth and follow its growth from a market-to-market -market hit in the Midwest to a full-fledged national smash, and also present excerpts of radio recordings from the winter of 1957 made by Jimmy following Tommy's death. Now a little bit about our presenter. Matt Barton became the curator of the recorded sound at the Library of Congress in 2008. From 1996 to 2003, he was production coordinator of the Alan Lomax CD collection series. I didn't know that. He was, he was written, ex excuse me, he has written extensively on recorded music and sound and has contributed to the 2012 book, The Ballad Collectors of North America. His two-year term as president of the Association of Recorded Sound Collections concluded in May of 2018. And boy, were you glad to, um, when that one happened. <laughs> Still recovering, eh? Yeah, I was still on the board until the uh, the conference in um, in Portland. Lucky. So it, it, en it ends in Portland, and I'll change my name and my email address. Yes, and, and uh, going to the witness protection program since he's in Washington. <laughs> yes, and all that. But anyway, uh, let me introduce Matt Barton for the evening, and I know, as always, it's going to be terrific. Matt, it is all yours. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out. It's a chilly night, and I know there's, uh, there's weather coming in. We were trying to get here up, up ahead of it. Let's just get to the start here. Okay. Um, I brought a few goodies with me. Not enough for all of you, but there are a few back issues of the Ars Journal over there, and then a special uh, printout of um, uh, one of our um, uh, great members, the engineer Gary Galo, two key articles he wrote on LP equalization, which is the kind of stuff that we stay up nights thinking about. <laughs> so, um, there he is, Jimmy Dorsey. Uh, I'll just preface this because I want to shut off my phone here. Um, I, uh, I became intrigued by this song, So Rare. Uh, before I ever heard it, I was leafing through one of the Joel Whitburn Billboard chart books and noticed that Jimmy Dorsey had a hit in 1957, the, the rock and roll era. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And I noticed that not only did it get all the way to number two, uh, it was on the charts for 37 weeks. Now, chart placings, you know, can be very debatable. You know, the difference between a number one hit and a number 10 hit is often a matter of influence, at least in the pre-sound scan days. Uh, however, you know, longevity really does mean something. And 37 weeks, which is more than nine months, uh, that's really something. So, you know, I, I checked it out and sort of kind of dug into it and discovered that, um, you know, Jimmy died in the middle of its chart run and, you know, uh, just became curious and started digging and found that, uh, you know, there were various conflicting stories from different sources and I just started trying to, to reconcile them. So <clears throat> that's how I got interested. Now, ostensibly though, this presentation is just about how this, a 1937 hit by Guy Lombardo, which was recorded by some other bands at the time, and it sounds like this. <laughs> Thank you. 
play the whole thing, but I want you to absorb this. of blossoms fair sweet as the breath of air fresh with the morning dew so rare you're like the sparkle of old champagne orchids in cellophane couldn't compare with you you are perfection you're my idea of angels singing the Ave Maria. Okay. Anytime a presentation starts with Guy Lombardo, you know, you know the things have to pick up a little bit. So we're going to fast forward 20 years, 1957. Here is Jimmy Dorsey's version. I figured I should play it at least once, play it all the way through. Now, it's an, it's an odd record for Jimmy Dorsey. It's an odd record for its time. And I, I think because of that, because it doesn't fit, you know, what are our now received ideas of what's rock and roll, uh, you know, it's not one that you find on greatest hits of the 50s compilations. However, it was a huge hit. And anybody who was around at the time and listening to Top 40 radio uh, remembers it. Uh, so. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, back up, and uh, I wanted to, I'm going to be throwing a lot of names at you, some of them familiar, most probably not, so I want to uh, introduce our cast, as it were. These, of course, are the Dorsey brothers. Tommy on, uh, 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 Tommy on the right, Jimmy on the left, all these pictures. This is from the early 1930s when they were leading a band together. Uh, this is from the 1950s when they got back together, and in between... Uh, there was a, a biopic made in 1947 called The Fabulous Dorseys, and it was reissued, re-released a few years later under the title of The Fighting Dorseys. Because uh, they, they had a famous, they, they were in incredibly tight as brothers. 
but um, they, they, you know, fought relentlessly. And uh, in, in 1935, and this is part of showbiz lore, some of you may know it, but some, some may not. 1935, they're rehearsing at Glen Island Casino in Long Island, and Jimmy, uh, Tommy rather, counts off a number, and Jimmy says, oh, Mac, isn't that a little too fast? Tommy storms off the bandstand, leaving Jimmy with the band and forms his own band. And for the next, well, really for almost 20 years, they are rivals. Uh, and they don't speak for the next five or six years. They only uh, start talking to each other again when their father is dying. Their father, who taught them music, uh, <clears throat> you know, and his, his ambition, his goal for his sons was to keep them out of the coal mines, which is what he did for a living. And so, uh, you know, from like 41, 42, they're getting along. They even occasionally make appearances together. They cut a few records. Uh, and they love to play pranks on each other when they're around, and they're pretty merciless. Uh, there's one I remember, this is from 50 or 51. Jimmy had just hired a trombonist. I think it might have been Cy Zentner. It was a fairly well-known trombonist, he, but he was pretty young then. Anyway, they were do he was doing a program together with Jimmy, and with, with Tommy, rather. Tommy was going to go on first, and uh, uh, Jimmy had his set list, and he said, Hey, kid, can you play Tommy's part on Marie? I said, yeah, sure. Can you play it higher than he does? He said, yeah. He said, it's in D. How high can you play it? He said, I can play it in F sharp. He goes like, all right, you stand over there. When Tommy com com comes out and, and plays Marie in D, you play it in F sharp. Must have been the most horrible thing <laughs> anybody ever heard. But that's the kind of thing they would do to each other. Um, so <clears throat> uh, that's a little introduction to the Dorseys. Jackie Gleason. Jackie Gleason is instrumental in bringing the two of them back together as, as, a, as, as band leaders. That's in 1953. Uh, Gleason's a fan from way back, and he's one of the most popular entertainers uh, of the age at this point. He can pretty much get what he wants. And so he, um, he's got his own, sh own show, which includes the Honeymooners as a segment, uh, and he starts a, um, <clears throat> a second show called Stage Show, which uh, sometimes features himself presenting artists, um, but more often than not is featuring the Dorsey brothers. This is in 1953. Uh, <clears throat> and that, it's big news when they get back together, but it's television that, that really makes them a big deal. Uh, Harry Carlson. Harry Carlson uh, was the man behind Fraternity Records in Cincinnati. Uh, he's the child of Swedish immigrants who did very well in farming in Iowa. And he, um, I don't know how, just how he settled in Cincinnati. He knocked around in the music business and was friends with the Dorseys going back to the 30s. He opened a photography studio in Cincinnati, very popular, very high-end uh, um, <clears throat> uh, photography studio. And if you look at Cincinnati papers, uh, again and again, you'll see credits, portrait credits to Harry Carlson. He wasn't actually the photographer, it was just his studio. And uh, like a lot of people who love music, who make a lot of money in some other line, I think he was lured by what Benny Carter once called the sweet smell of failure, and he started a record company. <laughs> uh, he did this in 1954, and um, his first... Uh, <clears throat> This is a story from a Cincinnati paper. He had just signed Jimmy Dorsey at that time. Uh, his first artist uh, <clears throat> was a singer named uh, Dick Noel. And Dick Noel, that's him on the right with Ray Anthony, was a band singer. And um, <clears throat> Carlson released a number of records on him. Uh, he, Dick Noel was, at that point, he was doing better on radio. But um, that's Dick Noel on the left. Jerry Winters, who did some recording for Carlson. Uh, Carlson in the back, and Kathy Carr. It's Kathy Carr who puts Fraternity Records in the black. After two years uh, in which um, <coughs> Carlson said he lost $250,000 uh, on Fraternity Records, Kathy Carr gives him a, a, a number 10 hit, Ivory Tower, uh, top 10 hit. Uh, <coughs> so some more shots of, of, of Dick Noel, and then below, these, uh, this is a, a segment of the Ray Charles singers, not Ray Charles, the, um, the one we all know, Ray, Ray Charles, who was a, uh, had a group, <clears throat> a choral group uh, doing easy listening records. And uh, there, wearing the glasses, sort of in the center, is Artie Malvin. 
Now, Artie Malvin was a member of uh, Glenn Miller's crew chiefs in the 40s and uh, <coughs> in, in the 50s organized a group who were variously known as the Artie Malvin Singers, the Artie Malvin Chorus, uh, <coughs> and they do a lot of radio and television and they're on a lot of records. Uh, and then Neil Hefty, very well established already as an, as a, an arranger. Tino Barzi, over on the right, these are the only contemporary pictures I could find of him. He's uh, uh, the Dorsey's manager. And Lee Castle, who didn't get a subtitle. Lee Castle, the third Dorsey brother. He's a tr lead trumpet for them. And uh, someone who's been with them, he was started with Tommy in the late 30s. Uh, Tommy loved him so much that he actually sent him to study with their father back in Pennsylvania. And, you know, hence the name the third Dorsey brother. And uh, he stayed with him through the 40s into the 50s, and he will, you know, figure prominently in the later story. And then finally, I, I lean heavily on um, items from various columns in this period uh, for news of Jimmy Dorsey's whereabouts, his health, and so on. One of them was Earl Wilson, who was a good friend of Dorsey. He wrote for the New York Post. He was, um, <clears throat> his column ran, the, the New York Post published six days a week, and he was in, the, <clears throat> in it every week, in it every day, rather. Uh, Dorothy Kilgallen, voice of Broadway. Oops. And Al Shottlecott, who wrote for the Cincinnati Inquirer and seems to have been a pretty good friend of Carlson because he's always writing about him. Um, <clears throat> but he provides a lot of the background to the story here. So uh, I wanted to get all of the, the you know, we're going to be hearing all those names again. Um, but back to the Dorsey story. Uh, the various historians will, will cite December 1946 when eight of the major bands, uh, you know, broke up. Most of them reorganized, but they cite that as the end of the swing era. And, you know, I suppose it's a, a good as date as any. Um, but uh, Tommy Dorsey's band broke up. He was really reorganizing more for business reasons. He wasn't throwing in the towel. Um, Jimmy kept going. He had uh, peaked somewhat later than many of the other band leaders. During the war years was really when he was most popular and in fact at times doing better than Tommy. Uh, <clears throat> Tommy is, you know, f was famed for his, for his temper, for his, uh, you know, leadership or dictatorship in, in bands. Uh, he was you know, much, much admired by musicians, but also much feared. And a lot of musicians um, just couldn't take him and left. And some of them even uh, joined Jimmy's band uh, because Jimmy was you know, much more easygoing, um, much more inclined to socialize with the musicians and was you know, just uh, generally a whole lot easier to get along. I found an interview with a trombonist named Saul Schlinger uh, who, who played in both bands, and he left Tommy Dorsey, this is around 1950, couldn't take him anymore, and Jimmy hired him. And Tommy decided if Jimmy hired him, he must be pretty good after all. Uh, so the, the, this pattern developed where um, uh, Dorsey would call up Saul, Tommy would call up Saul Schlinger and try and woo him back, and Schlinger would go to Jimmy and say, uh, Tommy called me, and Jimmy would roll his eyes and go, all right, what's it going to cost me this time? <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> but uh, eventually, Jimmy is feeling the pinch along with everybody else. Um, in the late 40s, though, he um, makes a clever move. Uh, this is when the Dixieland Revival is getting going, and he realized, hey, I can play that stuff. In fact, I did play that stuff back in the day. They're partly reviving me. So he uh, put together a first-rate Dixieland combo uh, featuring <coughs> uh, himself, Charlie Teagarden, uh, Ray Bodock, um, Cuddy Cutshall, a number of other first-rate players. They cut a couple of 10-inch uh, albums. No surprises in terms of, of repertoire, but it's really a pleasure uh, you know, to, hear, to hear the music you know, played by you know, just these, these top-flight musicians who were, who were there back in the day. Let me see if I can... Uh, there we go. This is a version of Struggle with some barbecue. Jimmy. 
um, didn't get, didn't put a fade on that one, sorry. Um, got a very unadorned slide here because I thought I'd just uh, play this and see how long it takes you to recognize it. This is uh, just to give an example of how Jimmy could be more adventurous musically than his brother. Tommy was uh, rather conservative about music. He hated bebop, for instance. Jimmy liked it. And uh, Tommy didn't think much of rock and roll, even though they later uh, uh, gave a hand to Elvis Presley, made his first appearances on stage show. Um, but he certainly was never going to, uh, the Dorseys were never you know, going to play that while he was around. So in 1951, uh, Jimmy does his version of a current hit. And here it is. Let's see how long it takes you to recognize this. Skip ahead because I've got I've quite a few slides. Hey, up, boy. Uh, he was on Columbia at that point. Yeah, they even they even managed to. I mean, in the 30s and most of the for, well till about 45 or 46, Jimmy was on Decca and Tommy was on Columbia that whole time. Jimmy was briefly on MGM and then he was on Columbia. By that time, Tommy had switched to Decca, so you know <laughs> they always found a way to be different. Um, so 1953. Uh, Jackie Gleason brings the two back together again. It's not entirely his idea. Uh, at, at this point, Jimmy is not doing well. I mean, he's doing fairly well for a, uh, a band leader of, of his generation, but there's much less money in the band music, in the band business at this point, and you have to work harder to get it. Uh, you, you still, the, the, the one-nighter circuit has become you know, tougher to work. You're traveling more. You know, further between gigs, and you know it's 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 tough, and he's almost fifty at this point, and uh, years of heavy drinking are catching up with him. Uh, he was an alcoholic, and years of heavy smoking are catching up with him. Uh, he, um, it's hard to, it's anecdotal, but it does appear that uh, you know one of his road managers ripped him off pretty seriously. He had tax trouble. Uh, his um, <clears throat> uh, he'd been divorced for a few years at this point. You know, I mean, it was all coming together. You know, it was kind of a perfect storm for him. Uh, Tommy's in better shape financially, physically, emotionally, and he wants to do something for his brother. They they really did have an extraordinary bond, and so. <clears throat> they get together again. And it's not, although they're usually billed as the fabulous Dorseys, officially it's the Tommy Dorsey Orchestra featuring Jimmy Dorsey. But in the eyes of the public, it's the Dorsey brothers, the fabulous Dorseys. But it's Tommy who's very much calling the shots uh, at, at this point. So I've got a short clip uh, coming up here from uh, the Honeymooners. Uh, <clears throat> they were featured prominently on a couple of Honeymooners episodes. So here you'll get the... Uh, the, the other version of how they got back together again. Matt, yes? That's post-date, said from Montana, talking to a woman the night before, four hours straight. Yeah, but that was typical. Yeah, okay. four hours, yeah. That, that, was, that was typical, you know. You would, and what they would do was um, 
Uh, nine to ten would be a sit-down concert, and Lee Castle would often be leading the band for that. And then the brothers would come out, they'd play two or three numbers together, and um, <clears throat> then Tommy would take, or rather, then Jimmy would take over, play his book, then uh, Jimmy would join the section, Tommy would come out, play his book, and, you know, they would finish with a couple of numbers together. Uh, but they would play nine to one. In fact, Tommy, um, before they got back together again, something that Tommy did that... <clears throat> uh, dance hall operators liked but musicians hated was he would give the location an extra half hour. They'd have to play until you know 12.30 or 1.30 depending. Uh, so yeah, I mean it was <clears throat> it was a tough way to make a living. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, I mean, here's Alice and Trixie. This is uh, December 26, 1953. If I can get this to play. Well, do you remember last year when Ralph was on the entertainment committee for the bus driver's ball? Yeah. Remember the terrible mix-up we had because he hired Tommy Dorsey and I hired Jimmy Dorsey? Mm -hmm. And all that mix-up and everything of Ralph's actually brought the brothers together after the long feud? Well, sure, how could I forget? But, but what's the coincidence? I'll show you. Look at this. See this briefcase? Yeah. Well, when I came out of Gimbel's today, I went in a phone booth to call my mother. Mm -hmm. And when I went into the phone booth, I found this briefcase. Well, I opened it up, and it is chock full of music. Now, guess who it belongs to? Guy Lombardo. <laughs> Tommy and Jimmy Dorsey. Oh. Now, isn't that a coincidence? Yeah. Well, now, I knew they were playing down at the Hotel Statler, so I called up over there. Mm -hmm. And I spoke to their manager, somebody, Tino Bozzi, and he Tino was tickled Bozzi. pink that I found it. Oh. So he told me someone was going to come over here today and pick it up. Oh, sure is a small world. Gee, Ralph's going to be home. Okay. Uh, now, <laughs> uh, Ne needs to be said that uh, <clears throat> when they got back together, it wasn't just a nostalgia exercise. It was mainly Jim, uh, Tommy's band, but Jimmy brought with him uh, three musicians, Jimmy Henderson on, on trombone, Bob Carter on piano, and Buzzy Browner on um, uh, uh, tenor saxophone, and, uh, and an arranger, Howard Gibling. And so the band was e expanded, and they were really, really good. Uh, I, I urge you, if you're not familiar with them, seek out the, the performances by, um, by this band. And uh, later in this episode of the, the Honeymooners, it's New Year's Eve, and it's supposed to be at the Statler Hotel, um, let's have a, uh, a sample of, of Tommy and Jimmy and the band at work. Oops. Ah. Why doesn't it want to do this for me? Yes. All the way down. 
fairy tales are the words. Will you surrender to me? Now, <clears throat> interesting thing, at this time, they didn't have a recording contract. They, uh, Tommy was paying for sessions, uh, uh, re for recording sessions, which he would then lease. And uh, they did a series of singles for this label, Bell Records, which, um, <clears throat> kind of hard to describe. Essentially, uh, they started in 52 or three, and they sold everywhere, that records were not sold, like newsstands and um, uh, dime stores and things like that. Uh, they made a record, a decent record actually, uh, Bell, Bell in general. It was a fairly good product and they sold for 39 cents, later 49 cents, half of what uh, 45s and, and, and 78s uh, sold for at that point. And you know, I guess it was a way to uh, you know, keep the, uh, the name out there. Um, <clears throat> They did a number of these, but uh, there were no Dorsey Brothers albums or anything like that coming out. You know, they were, uh, you know, between television and, uh, you know, more and more uh, residencies at the Cafe Rouge at the Statler, you know, also known as the Pennsylvania. Uh, they were doing very, very well. And in fact, you know, comparable to, you know, what they had both achieved at their peak. And that was really television. Um, <clears throat> I mean, this is just a, this is from a Michigan student, uh, U, U of M paper, 1955. J-Hop was an annual event there. So 13, 1,350 couples, 2,700 people in other words, uh, turning out to see the Dorsey brothers in 1955. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so life goes on, they're, they're doing well. They um, give a, a hand uh, to a young man named Elvis Presley who appears on several stage shows in early 1956, his first, um, <clears throat> his first television appearances. Um, and in uh, November 1956, Jimmy has a session on his own. It's the first time in four years that he's recording on his own name, and the first time in four years that he's recording without Tommy around. Uh, so, it, you know, the results are, um, <clears throat> well, we'll talk about the results in a minute. The whole thing is done apparently with uh, Tommy's blessing and uh, the band is largely drawn from the, the Dorsey Brothers Orchestra at that time with some changes. And <clears throat> it's our friend Harry Carlson. You can see him there uh, on the upper left next to Jimmy. I put together this slide because uh, all these people were there at the session. They're really the key players. Uh, Dorsey does, picks out four songs to do. One of them is so rare that we've already heard. And <clears throat> the uh, Carlson um, seems to have sunk a lot of money into the session because uh, people remember a string section being there and you know an expanded version of the Dorsey Brothers Orchestra. Um, 
Jimmy, though, decides he doesn't like the arrangement of So Rare that Howard Gibling has written. And so they reached a sort of an impasse. Uh, and <clears throat> Neil Hefty, to uh, Carlson's right, was uh, a conductor on the session. And he appealed to Neil Hefty for help with the arrangement. Uh, Dick Knoll, in one account, is given credit. Uh, 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 the, there's an account coming up where you see, we'll see that uh, Dick Knoll and, and Jimmy and Neil Hefty seem to have worked out the arrangement together. Uh, there's a vocal group on the record. These are the Artie Malvin singers. That's, they're flanking Pat Boone there. They were regulars on his show. I believe that's Malvin all the way on the left. And then here, um, the, this is the trombone section that day. Three of them are from the Dorsey Brothers Band. Uh, and the last one on the right is band leader Will Bradley, who was doing studio work that day. I guess he was subbing for Tommy Dorsey. You could do a lot worse than Will Bradley. And that's Vince Forrest, Jack Rains, and Billy Verplank, who got his chin cut off there. I'm sorry, Billy. Um, <clears throat> the record really comes down to this trombone choir, the Artie Malvin singers, the rhythm section, and Jimmy Dorsey. And <clears throat> they're varying accounts, uh, but they, they pretty much agree that, you know, while they were trying to figure out what to do, uh, Jimmy just started uh, kidding around with the, uh, the melody. And he started playing it pretty much in, in the style of Earl Bostick. And um, Carlson said, that's it. That's the way to do it, honky tonk. Uh, and <clears throat> let's see, I'm gonna, I've got my slides. Um, just, this is our Shuttlecott's uh, account here. So he did a honky tonk spoof, honky tonk with a small H and a small T. But here's the thing, Honky Tonk by Bill Doggett, Honky Tonk parts one and two was in the national and R&B top tens at this point. We're talking about November 12th, 1956. So <clears throat> a record man uh, from Cincinnati, which is the home of King Records, which put out Bill Doggett's Honky Tonk. Uh, <clears throat> when he says Honky Tonk, this is what he means. This Honky Tonk. And Cliff, with Clifford Scott on the saxophone. Now he's playing tenor and Jimmy's instrument was the alto. Um, but let's hear just a little bit of it. Did I attach it? Oh my goodness. Seem to have lost the, uh, the file on that one. Do we all know Honky Tonk? We all know Honky Tonk. Okay, good, good. <laughs> um, but that's, you know, I think that's really, you know, d decisive. You know, Car Carlson uh, cites that record and, you know, figures, all right, let's, let's do something like that. Um, but there's Earl Bostic, you know, and just to, um, oops. Just to remind you what Earl Bostic sounded like. His big hit, Flamingo, from 1951. Now, Earl Bostic and Jimmy Dorsey have a number of interesting things in common. They both play alto saxophone. They are both technically amazing musicians. I mean, just, uh, you know, who also you know, mentored a number of younger musicians. Bostic had John Coltrane, Blue Mitchell, Benny Golson, Lou Donaldson passed through his band. Jimmy Dolson, Jimmy uh, Dorsey, you know, mentored many musicians in his career too. Um, there as I can tell though, Earl Bostic never recorded a Jimmy Dorsey song. Maybe that was just, you know, he didn't want to be seen as copying another prominent altoist. And even though Bostic has his biggest hit in 1951, and you don't see him much in the charts after that, King Records does endless singles and endless albums on Bostic. They all sold. You know, you knew what you were getting with Bostic. He was very popular. My research, you know, I came across a reference to, um, this is in 56 or 57, you know, he drew, he drew five, a crowd of 500 to a club in Denver in the middle of a 16-inch snowstorm. You know, he had a following. And 
thanks to John Broman. I got to hear the session tapes uh, for So Rare, for the whole, uh, actually all four songs. And at one point, you don't hear um, uh, uh, Dorsey playing around with the melody yet. The takes are all pretty uh, coherent. They settle on what they were going to do. But at one point between numbers, he lets out a, like a long, raspy kind of note, and Carlson shouts, Yeah, Earl Bostic, that's it. <laughs> Now, I got my, didn't figure out my order properly. Um, the reason though, this, and this is purely conjecture, but something I stumbled on in the research was that 1956, a singer named Don Cherry, who'd been a band singer, was having his best year, Elvis notwithstanding, was having his best year as a solo act. Early in the year, he had a big hit with a song called Band of Gold, and he had a number of uh, follow-up hits. And in all of them, he was working with Ray Conniff. Uh, Conniff was writing these, you know, wordless, you know, vocable parts. And, <clears throat> you know, uh, we all know Ray Conniff took that to the bank in, in subsequent years, but that was really where he developed the style. And that summer, uh, Don Cherry recorded an album which sold quite well uh, and was also in the charts at the time of this session. And uh, guess what? It includes a version of So Rare. And uh, not much has happened with So Rare since 1937. There have been a few versions. George Shearing did one, Toots Tielemann did one, uh, Billy May did one, but they all stay pretty close to the original concept of it. Um, but Don Cherry does this version and I, I think this may have been what convinced uh, Dorsey and Carlson that you could update it. Uh, let's listen to a little bit of this. So rare, so rare, you're like so the rare. fragrance of blossoms fair. So rare, so rare, sweet as a breath of air. Fresh with the morning dew So rare, so rare You're so like rare. the sparkle of old champagne so rare, so rare. Orchids in cellophane la, 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 la. Couldn't compare to you You are perfection You're my dear of angels singing the Ave Maria For you're an angel I breathe and live you With every beat of this heart that I give you Okay, um, I think you get the idea. You know, it's a lot looser than what Guy Lombardo or anybody else had done with it. Um, it's got a hint of a backbeat. And, you know, I, I'm pretty sure they, that, that Carlson and Dorsey heard this record. Um, especially Dorsey, because he was always paying attention uh, to uh, what people were doing on record. He had a fire at his home in 1949, and it destroyed his record collection. He had 19,000 records. They would have all been 78s, too, in 1949, so you can imagine. And he, was he always uh, brought a portable record with him, record player with him on the road, and he was always, you know, either playing, you know, his, his latest record for people or playing things that he had just picked up. Um, so, you know, very much in tune with what was being released. Uh, okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, November 26th, Tommy Dorsey dies. He chokes to death in his sleep. Now, he had actually heard the record that Jimmy made a couple of weeks before. He hated it. Uh, he thought it was a disgrace to the Nor Dorsey name. He said he was going to buy up every copy and, and burn it. Uh, he just didn't like it. Uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> it uh, and uh, I suppose that the, the record would have um, <clears throat> come out anyway, but uh, Jimmy himself was also a little uncertain about it. He'd never cut anything like that before. And um <clears throat> I left a space for a picture of his daughter. I didn't get a good one, though. Um, so Tommy hated it. When Tommy's son, 
Thomas Dorsey III was in town for uh, Tommy's funeral, Jimmy played it for him, and he liked it, and he played it for his daughter. His daughter didn't even recognize it as being Jimmy, and, uh, but she said she liked it, so you know they were both in their 20s. The youth voted, youth must be served, and uh, <clears throat> Jimmy um, uh, gave Carlson the go-ahead to release it. Uh, that's more daily news coverage. Uh, he was locked. He, he choked to death on, on, on some food, uh, like a midnight smack, snack, I believe. He had taken Nembatol to sleep, and apparently that <clears throat> he would have, had he not done that, he would have just coughed up the, the crumbs, but the Nembatol suppressed that reaction, and so he choked. Really terrible way to go. Um, <clears throat> there's a picture worth a thousand words, two pictures worth a thousand words. That's Jimmy at Tommy's funeral. Now, he's already not well. Uh, <clears throat> some people say that he had already received a cancer diagnosis and, and Tommy actually knew about it. That's uncertain, a little hard to pin down. Um, but he's left with the band again. Uh, and <clears throat> he even tells people that he doesn't think he's going to live another year. And he tells Lee Castle, uh, you know, who who's, leads the band in the early part of the evening anyway, you know, he's, he apparently even just says to him, it's yours now, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, you know, I'll be gone soon, it's yours. Uh, <clears throat> but he carries on. They're in the middle of a uh, four-month engagement at the Cafe Rouge. That year they had signed a contract with the Statler for a six-month residency uh, worth a million dollars. I mean, that's, that's how well they were doing. The Statler even knocked out a couple of walls to increase the uh, uh, capacity of the Cafe Rouge to accommodate the crowds that they were getting. So Jimmy carries on with the band um, till through the end of the year, um, <clears throat> but he's, he's not doing well. Um, and you start to get these notices and the, 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 the gossip columns uh, about he's spending his days at Doctor's Hospital and his nights at the Cafe Rouge. Uh, you know, just what they're doing for him at Doctor's Hospital, hard to say, but, um, <clears throat> you know, he's, a, he's able to carry on at that point. More, more news like that. Yeah, and then this is um, Doctor's Hospital. The building's not there anymore. Doctor's Hospital was a, uh, <clears throat> established specifically for the rich and or famous. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, it was uh, quite, quite luxurious. And you know, from what I can tell, uh, the, the doctors, the whole staff there were, were rather tight-lipped. You know, they didn't, you know, if, if you didn't want them to know what your ailment was, they weren't gonna talk about it. Uh, <clears throat> so. And that's uh, it was, um, I think you can see a little bit of Gracie Mansion there. It's over in the night. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, torn down about 25 years ago, I think. Sooner? Okay. Yeah. All right. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, and at the end of the month, for instance, this is December 28th, um, it says he underwent throat surgery, but he's still working. You know, I, I apparently he had some kind of outpatient thing done, but he's still carrying on. Um, <clears throat> so that's December 28th. Here, this is NBC Bandstand. It was a daily show that was aired from 56 to 59, and they had live uh, uh, bands, name bands, in the studio. Uh, <coughs> and, um, and in the beginning, it was a two-hour show. They'd have two bands, so at this, uh, for this period, uh, the, Jimmy Dorsey would start it off, and that week, I think it was um, Billy Mays Orchestra was on the second hour. I, think, I don't remember now. Anyway, Burt Parks was the host, and we're going to hear a little bit of, um, it might take me, a, uh, can barely see this, the, um, <clears throat> let's see if I can get to the point I want. In today's news. Okay. The Egyptian government Oops. evidently is playing hard to get again, hard to pin down to a def. We'll be back in 55 minutes with more okay. news after the NBC Bandstand. Here's stand. NBC Bandstand. Spend Christmas Eve with Fred Waring and his Pennsylvanias tonight over most of these stations. This comes straight off of lacquers at the Library of Congress. 
And uh, <clears throat> I guess that this, there was probably a local announcement airing in this silent portion here. I didn't get a chance to, to edit these. So it's coming, any minute, it's coming. <laughs> Was the day before Christmas in the old bandstand room, Jimmy Dorsey is playing There's No Room for Gloom. Live from the beautiful Christmas, the NBC bandstand room in Radio City, it's the NBC bandstand. Contrast, NBC. Christmas week here in the bandstand room and on the stand is one of the most famous bands in all the land, Jimmy Dorsey and the fabulous Dorsey Orchestra. Tommy Mercer and Lynn Roberts will do much of the trilling and vocalizing this December 24th. And in our celebrity corner is song stylist Richard Hayes. Boy, these really have been Hayes days on the show. Last week, Bill, this week, Richard. And for a couple of wonderful musical hours starting right now is Jimmy Dorsey and his makes you want to hurry up and get your Christmas tree trim music. Jim, what's on our warmer upper this morning, well, my friend? Well, to properly warm up on a cold day, we ought to have moved to a warmer climb, Bert. Said Jimmy Darcy, looking mischievously, <laughs> as though he were ready to whisk us away to Spain. How about a little Spanish town, yeah, all right? let's go. Let's lay that one down. Two. In a little Spanish town. Once upon a Christmas Eve, a little... Okay, didn't want to. I'll cut Bert Parks off. I won't cut off Dorsey. Um, <clears throat> so this is uh, for the New Year's Eve uh, party at the Statler. And uh, the Dorsey and the orchestra were heard uh, on remotes that evening, uh, both on CBS and NBC. CBS before midnight, uh, break for Guy Lombardo, and then uh, Dorsey was on NBC after midnight. And uh, then, after probably staying up all night, he and the band were back on uh, <clears throat> the uh, NBC bandstand. Try and find the uh, good part. But here. there, the celebrants have a morning at news. This is Frank. <laughs> Jimmy Dorsey and the fabulous Dorsey Orchestra. The beautiful bandstand room in Radio City. 
Regulars in the vocal department are lovely Lynn Roberts and terrific Tommy Mercer. And our celebrity spotlight shines on America's favorite man about moons, Vaughn Monroe, right there. <laughs> oh, thank you, Bert. Thank you, Bert. And verbal sparks and vocal remarks by Bert Parks. Boy, listen to that resonance there. Isn't that great? This hour of the morning? Yes, sir. In about an hour from now, the Billy May Orchestra, directed by Sam Donahue, takes the stand. So we got us a real full first. Right now, Jimmy Dorsey picks a year, 1928 to be exact, and the song of that year, exactly 28 years ago last night. The cabaret jazz bands were playing this one for the dancers. Remember, Sweet Sue. January 1st, 1957, so far as I know, so far as I've been able to return, these are the last recordings of Jimmy Dorsey. Something may surface, because uh, he did he played after this, but these do appear to be the very last recordings that he made. January 1st, uh, he uh, <clears throat> may have made the um, uh, Cafe Rouge gig that night, but uh, at some point he tells Tino Barzi he's not feeling well and Barzi takes him to doctor's hospital. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> they, uh, they admit him and uh, it's announced that he's gonna have an operation. And the story that they put out, I don't know who came up with this phrase, but it's the one that Barzi keeps repeating is that he's got a wart on his lung. Uh, I think it, I, <clears throat> you know, without 
consulting a pulmonologist or some kind of specialist, my guess is that it's perhaps something similar, uh, the procedure was something similar to what Ruth Bader Ginsburg had done recently. Uh, and it was announced that uh, Dorsey would be in the hospital for 10 or 12 days and then he was gonna go down to Miami to rest up and he was gonna start a tour on uh, January 25th. And so he does appear to go down to Miami. Miami is kind of a second home for him. Uh, this is a local columnist who mentions uh, hanging out with Dorsey who was staying at the Coronado Hotel at that point. And um, <clears throat> there are, uh, you know, while he's resting up, there's some skullduggery going on. All is not well. Uh, Tommy, of course, had died recently. Uh, at the time, he was trying to reconcile with his third wife. They never actually got divorced, and of course, you know, she was left with everything and um, uh, was thinking about putting a Tommy Dorsey orchestra back on the road. And at, at this time, um, <clears throat> the only so-called ghost band that was out there was the Glenn Miller Orchestra being led by Ray McKinley, I believe. Uh, the first Tex Beneke led it after the war, then Ray McKinley did very, very well, um, simply you know, playing the Miller book. Uh, and <clears throat> so with uh, you know, the brothers having been doing so well before Tommy's death, it, it seemed like, well, you know, uh, uh, let's try and keep that going. Um, <clears throat> here's a little notice, Dorothy Kilgallen runs a little bit later, but this give you an idea of what was going on. She approached Lee Castle uh, about leading the organization. And um, if it was gonna happen, that probably would have meant Lee Castle taking all these musicians from Jimmy Dorsey, who had a, a tour booked at this point. Uh, <clears throat> Lee Castle, to his credit, did not do this. And it was a, another year before there was a, a ghost orchestra for Tommy Dorsey, led by Warren Covington at the time. So, um, The tour begins January 25th in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, and there are some gigs in uh, New Jersey, there's one in Pennsylvania, one in um, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. I've tried to reconstruct the itinerary as best as I can, but there are some gaps. Most of the tour is in the Midwest and the Southwest, especially Texas, and um, this is still good one-nighter territory, and it's uh, territory where the Dorseys had remained very popular. So it's a logical place to go, but it's a different, um, uh, different itinerary than uh, Jimmy had played uh, <clears throat> when he was still leading his own band a few years earlier, because he'd signed with MCA, Music Corporation of America, and he's largely following a, um, a route of one-nighters that uh, they set up. And so, <clears throat> This is um, from the uh, Texas Technical College uh, Toreador, Lubbock, Texas. Um, this is a, an announcement of upcoming events. Jimmy Dorsey's orchestra is one of them, uh, but also the Harlem Globetrotters. And 14-year-old uh, Dar Daniel Barenboim is, uh, <laughs> was uh, on, the, um, on the docket there. Uh, <clears throat> so, and there's an ad for the upcoming gig. Um, oh, and there's some, some stray slides, sorry about that. Uh, this, I think, is the band that he took with him. Some of them I can't confirm, others I'm certain of because their names appear in newspaper articles and, and so on. Now, apart from uh, Jimmy and Lee Castle and Charlie Shavers, most of these musicians are not terribly well known, but it's a first-rate group. And several of these players uh, went on to um, uh, careers on Broadway. Buzzy Browner, I believe, um, I can't remember what orchestra he was with, but he was a, had a symphonic job for many years. And just to give you an example, um, <clears throat> Dick Perry, trumpeter, who after this tour uh, worked mainly on Broadway. Um, I'm going to play just a little short clip from the Overture to Gypsy, uh, the original cast album. And apparently, if any of you were lucky enough to see it in its uh, original run, you'd have heard this every night. Uh, and you know, apparently it just brought the house down. So here's some, uh, some high note. Okay.
short and sweet. Um, <clears throat> so, this is an appearance um, <clears throat> Tuesday, February 12th, Little Rock, Arkansas. Despite the rumors, Dorsey will positively be in Little Rock. Why did they feel it was necessary to say that? Well, because <clears throat> here we have an announcement from February 9th, the fabulous Dorsey band featuring Jimmy Dorsey. Dorsey didn't make this gig. He was in the hospital. This is in Wichita, Kansas. February 7th, they were to play an Elks Lodge in Wichita, Kansas. Jimmy caught the flu. He's hospitalized in Wichita. The band goes on and plays three gigs without him in Amarillo, Texas, uh, <clears throat> and uh, Fort Worth, I believe. Sunday, they come back to Wichita. There was a second gig booked there. Uh, Jimmy's been discharged at that time uh, <clears throat> and apparently rejoins them, but this made all the papers. It was well known, so uh, evidently they felt it was necessary to reassure patrons in Little Rock, Arkansas that yes, you really will get to see Jimmy Dorsey. <clears throat> this article appeared, it will appear despite flu attack. Here he is again, feeling fit as a fiddle. Um, <clears throat> you know, something's wrong. Uh, uh, Dorothy Kilgallen er earlier had a um, short item in one of her columns at the beginning of the uh, tour said that his operation was more serious than people realized. That's all she said. Uh, <clears throat> but something's wrong. You know, Jimmy, is his immune system is compromised. He's prone to getting things like this. Uh, but at the same time, look at this. This is a report from a disc jockey. It appeared in the February 9th cash box. So Rare on Fraternity to Records has been out since the first week of January. Carlson later says that they sold 25 copies in the first two weeks. And uh, he, he panicked, started calling in every favor that he could, and managed to build it into a local hit in Cincinnati. Uh, this is the first mention I find of anybody playing it. Now, the, the, the street date is February 9th, but really we're probably talking about, this was probably filed about 10 days earlier. So by the end of January, it's a, it's a thing around Cincinnati and being heard. And <clears throat> a couple of weeks later, February 23rd, it appears for the first time in Billboard's Hot 100. Now, Billboard was the only, uh, unlike Cashbox and other trades, Billboard was the only one that had a, tr a chart that big, 100 spaces. And it was not, actually, they were not even calling it the Hot 100 at that time. And, <clears throat> you know, it was just kind of a cumulative rating based on all the reports that they got. Excuse me, I need a bit of water. <clears throat> It comes in at 86, and that probably reflects um, <clears throat> the action in Cincinnati and uh, adjacent areas. Um, but that's, you know, that's pretty remarkable in itself that uh, Jimmy Dorsey in 1957 has released a record that is actually a hit, if only a local hit. Now, <clears throat> just an aside, I'll go back to our friend Earl Bostic for a moment. On February 28th, Bostic goes into the studio in Los Angeles. Uh, the, Jimmy Dorsey's record is on the chart. I'm sure this is not lost on Sid Nathan of, of uh, 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 King Records. For the only, as near as I can tell, for the only time in his career, Bostic goes into the studio with a chorus. And he cuts a version of September Song uh, with, with a chorus. Let's just hear a little bit of it. idea. Uh, <clears throat> nothing much happens with the record. It's not a hit, and it's a formula that Bostic and Sid Nathan never try again, but one of these things that you, you, you stumble on and you think, coincidence? No, I think not.
Here's a review of a uh, record that I haven't been able to track down. Um, somebody else tried the formula, nothing happened. Uh, <clears throat> many of these gigs that uh, Dorsey is playing, uh, it, it's our colleges, and uh, colleges are still good territory for the bands at this point. Now this is not in, in Texas, this is the, from the student newspaper at um, uh, Eastern Illinois State University, Charleston, Illinois, where I've been. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's a nice place, it's a small town. Uh, <clears throat> this was in student paper, noting that uh, they were trying to get Dorsey. Uh, and then uh, from the same issue, an editorial complaining about the, uh, the powers that be at the university are only bringing in classical music and the students need something a little lighter, please. And they mention uh, Dorsey down here. Contract is signed, it's coming. Another, um, <clears throat> you know, in attendance, okay. Attendance of Jimmy Corr's Dorsey concert in March may give the powers that be some indication of just exactly what kind of entertainment we want. Yes, it shows what the student wants. Uh, March 20th, 1957. They drew 1,400. And uh, the, the, <clears throat> the size of the crowd that D Dorsey was drawing, it varies. There was a gig in San Antonio, only drew 200. Uh, there was another one in Sonora, which is a small town, but it was an annual event that they had there uh, in a warehouse, drew 2,000. Uh, Alva, Oklahoma, another small town, but it had a university, played in a 3,000-seat uh, venue. So, you know, the numbers vary widely, but, you know, there's, there's an audience there. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, it does appear that after that stay in the hospital, Dorsey is making all these gigs. I haven't been able to find anything that said he didn't. But then, uh, this is from part March 11th, a uh, newspaper. Uh, I don't know how well you can read this. This is a clip I found, and then... Couldn't find it again. Um, <clears throat> Sunday night, March 10th, playing in Joplin, Missouri. They played an afternoon uh, show and an evening show. Late in the evening show, the story goes, Dorsey receives word that his mother, Tess, who lives in an apartment in New York, is ill. He charters a plane for, uh, to go to, from, to Kansas City from Joplin and then gets a scheduled flight to New York. He gets there. She's feeling well again. That's the official version. Now, it may actually have been that uh, he was feeling ill and went back to rest because they had a, they were due to open at Roseland on March 19th for a month. Uh, so it may simply have been, you know, a, a, a cover for that, or she may have been ill. She was quite old. In any case, um, <clears throat> Dorsey misses the next several gigs, including that one in Eastern Illinois State. Uh, apparently they went okay without him, but there are now several gigs where Dorsey's not there, and it's a problem. You know, people have uh, paid for Dorsey and they're not getting him. Uh, <clears throat> so, here is a, uh, you can see Jimmy Dorsey, Sammy Kay preceded him at Roseland. Uh, Dorsey's starting March 19th. Now, he makes that gig. Uh, he's there to open, uh, <clears throat> and apparently draws a big crowd, and people say that that was partly because there have been all these reports about how ill he was and there was a sense that this was the last chance to see him. And this turned out to be right. Uh, he <clears throat> made it through the first few nights of the gig. Here's a picture from Cashbox. Not sure exactly when it was taken, but there he is uh, on the left. These are the J sisters who were in town to appear on Jackie Gleason's show, and Paul Whiteman. And it gets a little hard to pin down now. But uh, <clears throat> John Frost, the trumpeter, told Peter Levinson, Tommy Dorsey's biographer, that at one point uh, they were playing and they came back for the second set. Dorsey wasn't there. Uh, Tino Barzi went up to his room. He had a room in the Statler. Found him about to jump out the window. And I think, and it's just conjecture, this appeared in Earl Wilson's column Friday of that week. I think he's, just, he, he's alluding to this incident. However, the following Tuesday, 
He's saying, Jimmy Dorsey's leading the band at Roseland from a chair, hurt his leg in a bathtub fall. That may be true. Uh, my guess is that <clears throat> Jimmy managed to get through the next couple of nights, uh, but, but that was it. The band was supposed to be back on NBC Bandstand that Monday. They didn't make it. And the band carried on without him for that week, and then the remaining two weeks of the, week, uh, <clears throat> of the engagement was, was canceled. And um, uh, uh, Charlie Spivak, who was a Dorsey alumnus, uh, filled the rest of it. So <clears throat> Jimmy goes back down to Miami, uh, ostensibly to rest. There are notices in the, the gossip columns saying, always, oh, you know, he's resting up. He'll be back, folks. You know, never has heard a discouraging word. Um, <clears throat> in fact, he's doing worse and worse. And, uh, but at the same time, So Rare is doing better and better. Uh, the band seems to be breaking up at the beginning of April, but then it enters the national top 40 in Cashbox and Billboard, and it's gathering steam throughout most of the country. What do you do? Well, Lee Castle continues to lead the Jimmy Dorsey Orchestra, and they have a 10-week engagement at back at the Statler in the Cafe Rouge. Apparently goes very well. Um, Jimmy is still back in, uh, in Miami. Um, what is so rare, to paraphrase the poet, as a Jimmy Dorsey recording titled, What is So Rare? This is a CBS rare. remote from it's May. It's going great guns these days, one of the great the efforts of this great Jimmy. musical organization. If you'd like to drop down to your record shop Gotta tomorrow, the record. here's the way it'll sound. They were so on rare. CBS every night for two weeks. I figured this must be the arrangement that they played on the road, because they had no uh, chorus with them. I don't know who's subbing for Jimmy. the top 10 without that kind of push, but, you know, who else was getting this kind of play at that point? And I think it ensured that Jimmy's original audience uh, got to hear the record over and over again. So you've got teenagers buying the record, and you've got these original audience buying the record. Oops. What is so rare, to paraphrase the poet, as... Oh, don't want to repeat that. Um, <clears throat> this is from the middle of May. It's topped the half million mark. Now, in addition to the old audience and the young audience, it's also reaching the rhythm and blues audience, the African American audience. Now, <clears throat> it's in this period, and um, it's harder often to um, track the um, uh, records in this market because of the, the charts were simply smaller. Billboard uh, at this point had an R&B chart with 15 slots on it. Uh, <clears throat> Cashbox is doing one with 20 slots, sometimes 25. So, uh, you know, it takes longer for records to appear there. However, Cashbox is running this, Territorial Tips. Uh, this is from all of their, uh, you know, R&B uh, disc jockeys and, and retail outlets. It's alphabetical, <laughs> so you can't tell just how well something is doing. But you see, So Rare is there. And it's, it's been actually been on this chart for several weeks. Within a couple of weeks, it's on both the Billboard and um, <clears throat> uh, Cashbox charts. And it remains there, as it does uh, on the pop charts, through the summer. So we're now in late May, late May, and Jimmy's been back in New York for a few weeks. Cork O'Keefe, who managed the Dorseys in the uh, 30s, went to see him in Miami and found him just looking horrible. This is in mid-April. 
and said, you're going back to New York. And he sends him, takes him straight to doctor's hospital. And this is where Jimmy spends the rest of his life. And even at this point, the, the, um, <clears throat> the gossip columnists, the, the little items that appear, uh, you know, they're, they're really soft peddling it. They're, they're talking about, they mention everything except cancer. He's got neuritis, he's got bursitis, may have all been true, but he was dying of cancer. It's as simple as that. And <clears throat> by the, the middle of May, he's, you know, un under heavy sedation. He doesn't always recognize people. He's having, uh, you know, bad days and not so bad days. So, you know, Bing Crosby tries to see him a couple of times and they actually say, no, he just can't see anybody now. Uh, Tess, the mother, lives nearby. She's at the hospital every day, as is Lee Castle. And um, a number of other people that come by when they can, you know, they uh, go to his room where uh, <clears throat> the nurses are actually, you know, posting uh, the chart positions for Jimmy. He can see how well So Rare is doing. And presumably, I, I, you may have heard some of these band remotes too, but he's going, he's going fast. Uh, it's, it's not good. And, uh, <clears throat> but again, you know, he's, he's getting some, uh, some help that other artists wouldn't have gotten. Um, we're going to see a clip of uh, Perry Como from late May singing So Rare. Well, the reason we chose So Rare, friends, this week is because it's a big hit record for one of my uh, very dear friends, namely Jimmy Dorsey. And we hope that Jimmy is listening, and of course, uh, we're all rooting for him to uh, get well kind of quick. So, Jimmy, I hope you're listening, and uh, this is for you, buddy. Unusual chart for so hearing Bobo singing with it. You're like the fragrance of blossoms fair. You're sweet as a breath of air, fresh with the morning dew. Okay, we won't uh, hear all of it. It's a very uh, poignant uh, item that uh, Dorothy Kilgallen ran. Uh, Russ Morgan was an old friend of the Dorseys, went all the way back to uh, Pennsylvania with them. Uh, Russ Morgan's band boy visited Jimmy Dorsey in the hospital and, uh, you know, found him in a good mood, but, you know, he just nodded off in the middle of a sentence. And they finally start uh, acknowledging, uh, you know, how, how badly off he is. This is from May 27th. And he dies on June 12th. Um, I chose this because it was a Pennsylvania paper. They, they put it on front page, gave it a heavy coverage. And Jimmy was divorced, but he never remarried. Their mother, their father, they were, were very devout Catholics. And um, Tommy, who had been married three times, um, uh, could not be uh, receive the rights of the Catholic Church, but Jimmy could. And he had a, um, a solemn requiem at St. Patrick's on, I believe it was June 17th of uh, 1957. Here's Tess Dorsey being helped into the church. And the quality of this photograph is very poor. I'd like to, like to find it. It looks like it's snowing. It wasn't. Uh, but that's Jimmy's coffin. And on the far right, this is Guy Lombardo. Next to him is Jackie Gleason. They were honorary Paul bear bearers, um, <clears throat> as were um, uh, Harry Carlson. Um, Rocky Marciano and a number of other uh, notable people. Uh, and uh, finally, a few weeks after the funeral, Tino Barzi um, uh, you know, comes clean and starts talking about what Jimmy was actually going through. And he says, you know, Jimmy was suffering from an incurable cancer of the lung. There are some people who can be told these things and Jimmy was not one of them. So according to, to Barzi, and this may be so, all of this, all, all of the um, announcements that they were handing out and avoiding the, the, the word cancer was so that Jimmy wouldn't know how bad off he was and he was on the road. Um, a doctor had told Jimmy's mother that it would be better for him to be on the road playing than not. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to you know, question what a doctor said at, at this distance, but you wonder, you know, was it really the best place for him to be? Uh, 
you know, doing one-nighters in, in Texas um, just a couple of months before he died. That's how it was. Uh, somebody remembered, uh, somebody found out that um, Sharp and Hurst, who wrote It's So Rare, so rare <clears throat> were still around and happy to cash the checks that they were getting. Uh, the thing about them, this is the only hit they ever had. It's virtually the only thing that they, of theirs that was ever recorded. So, <clears throat> you know, t they got a nice windfall in 1937 and another windfall in 1957. Um, <clears throat> Harry Carlson is in New York and uh, he says, by agreement with Dorsey, they were there to record enough material to create a Jimmy Dorsey album with the, adding that to the four tracks that had been recorded in November. And um, with uh, Dorsey's ascent, it would be Dick Stabile, uh, who sounded a lot like Dorsey and was a fine player, who would um, be Jimmy Dorsey on those records. Now, it's very important that there was never any attempt to conceal the, the, this. When the album was released, it states very clearly that Jimmy Dorsey is on four tracks and Dick Stabile is on the others. And they released a single uh, featuring Stabile called June Night, uh, which was actually something of a hit itself. And at the same time, So Rare is still in the top 10 through the whole summer and uh, into the fall. It remains in the top 40. Lee Castle is out there uh, leading the Jimmy Dorsey Orchestra, and they are working every night uh, all over the country. Uh, <clears throat> and I mentioned the rhythm and blues charts uh, a little earlier. Here's an interesting thing. I don't know how well you can read this. This is from the Norfolk, Virginia Journal and Guide, African-American newspaper. And it was dust dark on July 31st at 7 p.m. when a crowd of Roberts Park residents and other interested persons gathered to see, they called it the Session of Festival of La Luna. The program consisted of all musical interpretations. Master of Ceremonies, Otis Williams, I sincerely hope that's Otis, the Otis Williams of the charms. Um, uh, Otis Williams welcomed everybody and the Roberts Park Majorettes added their touch by performing unusual Majorette steps. After the formal opening, the program began with a bang. The program was divided into three parts, each dealing with the tempo of the recording. The first group was hit tunes, beginning with So Rare and ending with Miss Anne, which is a Little Richard song. Uh, the crowd was held spellbound as the performers presented each number with perfection. Next on the program were the square dancers, uh, such skipping and diving for the oyster. Uh, and then the ending was very sophisticated because the modern dancers interpreted Sophisticated Swing by Jimmy Dorsey. Sophisticated Swing was the B-side of So Rare. So, <laughs> uh, you know, just to give you some idea of the, the presence that the song had that summer. Now, <clears throat> These are three albums of the Jimmy Dorsey Orchestra uh, that appeared on Epic. Jimmy Dorsey's not on them. It's the Lee Castle Jimmy Dorsey Orchestra. And um, <clears throat> the first, they, uh, oops, that's the slide I was talking about. The first, uh, hi-fi stereo renditions of uh, Jimmy's greatest hits. The second one was the, uh, um, the Dorsey book that they were playing uh, on tour in 57 and 58. And then this one, Goodies and Gassers. They're versions of rock and roll songs. Uh, and one of these, a version of um, Wilbert Harrison's Kansas City, actually stayed in the Jimmy Dorsey Orchestra book, at least into the 1970s. Uh, and then there was a single, Big Bad Train, Lee Castle and the Jimmy Dorsey Orchestra. Early 59. This is Pete Myers, Mad Daddy, Ohio Radio. This is not a hit, but Myers really liked it and used it as one of his themes at the time. A little too close to Peter Gunn, I think, to... Uh, be a hit on its own. There's a good 
shot of one of Myers. Now, going back to the cast of characters we met at the beginning, one of the ironies of the whole story of So Rare is that almost everybody, apart from Jimmy Dorsey, uh, goes on to bigger and better things, even if they don't become uh, nationally famous. Harry Carlson uh, had a very good run of hits for the next 10 years or so. Uh, he never uh, threatened to rival Sid Nathan's King Records, but he did quite well. Um, he, the next year he had a number one hit with um, uh, Bobby Bear's All-American Boy. He uh, discovered Lonnie Mack and had several hits with him. Um, did pretty well for a, a, a number of years. Dick Knoll became known as the King of Jingle Singers. One of these people you've heard a thousand times and you just don't know his name. He only died a couple of years ago. Artie Malvin um, did similar work for a long time. Uh, Neil Hefty, it's, you know, I think we all know he did very, very well uh, subsequently. Uh, Tino Barzi went on to a very successful career in, in management. And um, I wanted to, uh, at, the, at the end here, I wanted to address some of the myths and legends that have, have grown up around um, the record. One is that Dick Stabile and not Jimmy Dorsey is heard on So Rare. And uh, <clears throat> it's simply not the case. There are several accounts of the session and everybody says it's Jimmy Dorsey. This, this rumor did not even start until the, um, <clears throat> uh, the, the fraternity album came out with Dick Stabile's name on it. Uh, Stabile never uh, toured with the orchestra or anything like that. He did do a television appearance. There was a, a television tribute to Jimmy Dorsey later in the year, and uh, he appeared on it. I haven't been able to track that clip down, but he probably played uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, a So Rare, and that may have fueled the speculation. Also, again, I, I've heard the session tapes, and while there's no smoking gun movement where, moment where someone says, hello, Jimmy, or hello, Dick, uh, you can hear Jimmy quite clearly counting numbers off, and I'm pretty sure that's his voice. Uh, so, no, it's, it's Jimmy Dorsey. <clears throat> Again, there was never any attempt to hide this. It's on the record. Also, Carlson took out uh, these ads, and this is a two-page spread that he took out, uh, these ads in the trades telling the whole story uh, behind the session, you know, uh, <clears throat> and that it was, you know, Dorsey playing so rare and stabile and other numbers. Another legend, you'll see this a lot. Lee Castle presented Jimmy Dorsey with a gold record for So Rare two days before he died. No. Uh, Carlson did have a gold record made, but it wasn't presented uh, <clears throat> to Jimmy before he died. It was presented to, uh, to Tess Dorsey and Jimmy's daughter, Julie, uh, after he died. And, <clears throat> you know, he talks about, here's an article where, he, where Carlson talks about his desire to give Jimmy a record, but it hasn't made, it hasn't sold a million yet. So, <clears throat> you know, something that people were talking about. I think <coughs> if there's any basis to the story, it may be that, you know, two days before Jimmy died, Lee Castle was there uh, and in a lucid moment told Jimmy that uh, uh, Carlson was having a record made. Because he mentions it, it's in the articles about Jimmy's funeral. Uh, Carlson mentions that they're going to do that. So I think that's where that uh, originated. But I'm absolutely certain that did not happen. There's a uh, picture... Uh, there's Carlson presenting the disc. I blew this up. Um, here are these regional charts, retail outlets. This is from late July, and uh, So Rare is still on most of them, except in the markets where So Rare has already been a hit, like in, in around uh, uh, Cincinnati and Detroit. There's a closer hit in there. And um, the last myth... Um, uh, several sources say that Jimmy had a lung out uh, at the beginning of January, went in the hospital. Uh, again, I haven't been able to talk to a specialist, and I know that you can live with only one lung, and I've heard of musicians who recover sufficiently to play saxophone or other wind instruments, but I just don't see someone like uh, uh, Jimmy, uh, who is already in poor health, being able to play uh, you know, three weeks after such an operation. I, you know... It, Correct me if I'm wrong, I just don't think that's possible. Uh, I think he had a, a, a procedure like Ruth Bader Ginsburg did. Maybe later, um, when he was the last two months of his life and he was back in the hospital, maybe they removed a lung then, but I, I don't think it could have happened before then. 
And, oops, yes. Um, this is what, when uh, Jimmy died, this is what uh, his nephew said, that he went to visit him. He was in town for his father's funeral. And he said he played it for him, played so rare for him on the sax, because it was great. And that's how I want to remember my uncle, a great musician who really enjoyed life. And, uh, oops. And I think that's the end. So. <laughs> Had another clip of Dorsey on the Honeymooners to, to show you. I, for some reason, that one seems to have migrated. But anyway, if I can pull it up. But I'll take uh, questions now, and I'll search for that video. <laughs> Uh, yes, Tim. Uh, what, what's the, what's Sorry. The other three, um, the other three sides that were cut at the so rare session. Yes. Uh, are they anywhere in any way similar? Are they as adventurous? No, no not at all. Or except they, except or? they do have the same kind of arrangement with the trombone chorus and and the the Malvin singers. Are they trying to make the charts? Are they trying to be contemporary on those? They don't. They none, none of them seem like good single material to me. One of them is a version of um, uh, Mambo Number no. Five by Pres Prado, you know, which had been popular, right. and, right. and Jimmy had had a number of Latin-flavored hits. So, you know, maybe that's what attracted him to it. Uh, sophisticated Swing, which a number of bands, it was a '30s number, a number of bands had cut that, and then one of Jimmy's own compositions, "It's the Dreamer in Me." one of the songs that he co-wrote with uh, James Van Hughes. I'm thinking the performance style. I mean, they were going for the charts with this. Oh, with yeah. That heavy backbeat and everything. Yeah. yeah. With well, and also, he's not playing that raspy, bluesy style on, on those either. Okay. One other question. Did he promote this record on his, on his tours? Oh, yeah. yeah. So he's playing it regularly from the time yes. it came out? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Sort of a, an adjunct side point. But <clears throat> you showed one slide where it was a period where there was no uh, there was no recording contract, and they had leased the recordings out, and they were released on I think it was called Bell. Bell Records. And you yes. showed the two, yeah. and it jogged this strange memory for me. Now I think this is the I found same the clip. Bell we'll records, play it after the questions. <laughs> same Bell Records that that existed through at least through the mid '70s. I know in my st stacks of records, all of a sudden <laughs> I saw the Bell in a silver three circle kind of. Partridge yeah. Family and Rumpelstiltskin was the name of a band, yeah. and then yeah, there, there's a there's a history there. John Broven can probably reconstruct it better than I can. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, the the Bell label that you showed, Matt, was uh, founded by Arthur Shimkin, and um, it was a budget label. Uh, it was uh, related to Golden Records, a children's label, and was in fact owned uh, by Simon and & Schuster. And uh, then it gradually progressed where um, Arthur uh, handed over the reins in the, in the early 60s and Larry Utel took over the Bell Records, and I think you're referring to the Fifth Dimension and uh, Lee Dorsey and so on. I uh, have to say that uh, I, I interviewed Arthur in the late 1990s. He's no longer with us, but what a fascinating man. Um, he, he just had a, a memory that, uh, uh, for, for example, he... he told me all about the how the bells bell records were pressed with styrene plastic uh, which was quite an advanced uh, uh, technology at the time yeah. but he literally just uh, there he was in his late 70s um, very privileged to interview him yeah. and uh, uh, but Matt I'd like to say very much enjoyed your presentation uh, I, I thought the musicianship that we heard throughout was was just fabulous and uh, just a great reminder. Two questions: um, Where was so rare recorded? 
November uh, uh, 12th, uh, 1956. November 11th, sorry, which was a Sunday. And Sunday was the, the day off from the Café Rouge. And, and where was it recorded? Oh, Capitol Studios on 46th Street oh. here in New York. And the remaining tracks, which were largely the same group with Dick Stabile and one or two other changes, those were recorded at Webster Hall. And I didn't mention it, but Sam Herman, who was the guitarist, uh, he fueled the Dick Stabile speculation because he wrote a book about his career and he remembered, he, conf he conflated the two sessions and said that at the time he was outraged because they were putting out this record with Jimmy Dorsey's name on it and it was really Dick Stabile. Uh, and it was it's simply his memory playing tricks on them, on him. You know, he did two, two sessions in different studios, both in New York, but he conflated them, uh, <clears throat> you know, and said that it was, you know, Stabile's name was suppressed. It never appeared on the record, only Dorsey's name. It just isn't true. And my colleague David Sager actually once talked to Herman about him and, and you know, said more or less what I said. And Herman said, well, yeah, you may be right about that. So... <laughs> Well, fascinating Capitol Studios. That explains why it's such a good sound. Doesn't yeah, it? yeah. And again, those session tapes, which you were able to, I can't remember the fellow's name at, at Ace. You Roger know. Armstrong. Yes, 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 who I owe many thanks to. Uh, getting to hear those. Uh, oh, one other thing. Um, a lot of accounts say there were only two takes of So Rare. There were actually six or seven. Uh, and you know, Dorsey's solo changes somewhat from one to another. Uh, Billy Verplank, the trombonist, in an interview said that uh, it was essentially, he gave Hefty all the credit for the arrangement, but he, and he said that it was essentially a head arrangement that he came up with in the studio and he sang the parts to the trombones, what he wanted them to play. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> Matt, just a quick yeah. follow-up question. Um, fraternity at the time, okay, it had to have crappy childhood, but it, it wasn't one of the major independent no. Um, how did it manage to to cater for such a big hit? You know, with the distributors, I, pressing plants, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, I, I suppose you know. I mean, Carlson had you know he'd, he'd managed to pay his bills with the Kathy Carr <laughs> hit, and um, from what I can tell, uh, Carlson was a very popular, well liked person around Cincinnati. I think there was a lot of goodwill that he could call on. And he, one thing I didn't get into, um, Carlson gave a lot of credit to a song plugger named Bill White, who was in Cincinnati and who was with Robbins Music Publishing, who published So Rare. And Bill White, I hope somebody interviewed him at some point because he started in the business in 1910 and didn't retire until 1960. I mean, you can imagine, you know, the things he knew. Uh, and, and White, uh, when it was reaching the, nearing the top 40, he, he brought in White, and White, uh, you know, got busy. And, uh, you know, Carlson gave him a, a lot of credit uh, for promoting it. But, you know, Carlson also, again, you know, benefited from, there was a, the, the reservoir of goodwill that existed for Jimmy Dorsey. So when it became clear that, you know, it was this, you know, regional hit that was still growing and, <clears throat> you know, uh, NBC, people at NBC and CBS, you know, who used to do remotes of J Tim, John, Timmy, Timmy, of Jimmy and Tommy Dorsey, uh, you know, in the 30s and 40s and, and of the reunion band in, in, in the 50s, you know, saw an opportunity to, you know, push something that they liked as opposed to the latest Elvis or, or Pat Boone. They, they really took it. Now, there are, I believe, 10 surviving uh, uh, CBS band remotes from May of 1957. I've heard them. So Rare is on nine of them. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. Man. Thank you. Oh, anyone? Yes, in the back. Uh, my first encounter with uh, So Rare was uh, in nine, well, the first copy that I owned of So Rare, I believe, and I could be wrong, was released on an album under the, uh, the company named Dot. Yes. And, and half of it was Jimmy Dorsey, okay, 
and that, that's why I'm kind of confused about, okay. I'm wondering about my memory, yep. because there was a, 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 an indication on the record that some of the other solos that were done after Jimmy died, the solos were by Skippy Galluccio, who was a guy ah. I eventually met. Oh, okay. And uh, maybe so he's anyway, the one. Pl maybe he's the one doing Dorsey's part on the the band remote. Um, uh, it, it's, I, I, as I said, I met him. I right. never discussed this with okay. him. Okay. But there is a story which I I have. Uh, every reason to believe is true, that he had Jimmy Dorsey's alto. Hmm. And that somebody approached him that said they were from the Library of Congress. Or Wasn't they me. actually <laughs> approached his wife. This was, I don't know if you've heard the story. No. But uh, they actually, it was after uh, 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 Skippy passed away, hmm. and they approached his wife about perhaps donating this and it was a scam, and it never, it, oh. she gave them the alto, oh, and no. it, it disappeared. Yeah. But anyway, you started to say something yeah. about okay. that Dot record. The Dot record is it's the same as the um, Fraternity album. Okay. Dot licensed it three or four years later. I think it came out in 61 or 2, yeah, and the, the original recordings right, yeah. were, were, were mono. Uh, Dot released it, I believe, in mono and rechanneled stereo. <laughs> Uh, and I've, I've actually, I, I don't think I've ever seen a copy, or if I did, I wasn't, didn't have the interest and didn't read those notes, because that, well, I'm, what I'm you say sure about I Skippy Galluccio, that's not on that information, he's credited, but that information is not in the notes to the uh, fraternity release. Oh, really? Is that so? Yeah. That's interesting. The fraternity release has notes by uh, Earl Wilson, Jimmy's friend, and it talks about the sessions, and um, he also you know, tells stories about Jimmy, and it's, it's very sweet, actually, because it covers the whole back cover, and at the end, he writes, gee, I've been writing for a long time about Jimmy. I must have really liked him. <laughs> <laughs> also, writing up here, Milton and I were listening to uh, a thing I've had uh, <clears throat> for many years, back to 62 or 63. Uh, it was a double capital, uh, no, I'm sorry, double Columbia set with both Tommy and Jimmy on the record, and some of the charts were by Dean Kincaid, and some of them hmm. were by Ernie Wilkins. Yeah. It was, was kind of like, some that stuff sounded like, kind of like a Basie record. Yeah, you know. yeah. I and mean, there were a number of, there was Howard Gibling, there, there was Ernie Wilkins, and one of the Lee Castle albums I showed you, the Jimmy Dorsey on tour, which is not a live album, uh, four or five of the tracks on there are Ernie Wilkins compositions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, he was one of the, um, you know, principal and rangers. Um, I, th I think the only uh, contributed one uh, piece to the Dorsey book that they ever played, uh, but uh, Tad Dameron uh, oh, yeah, yeah, did I a piece called too. Bula Beige, yeah, I heard uh, that which too. Jimmy continued to play after Tommy's death. I heard that too. Yeah. Uh, uh, over here. Just a bit of incidental intelligence. <laughs> Cancer was treated as if it were a dirty word. Mm. And even as if it could be con contracted simply by mentioning it. Mm. The closest one got until, oh, I guess about the 70s was the big C. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because it wasn't um, it wasn't until the very end. I mean, really, after he died, that they said it's cancer. It was cancer. That's what he died of. Um, but he was a heavy smoker. I read an interview with one of the musicians, you know, who, who said, you know, I mean, he and he and you know, he'd done um, endorsements for uh, a couple of the big brands, and he said that you know they just. You know, every day they would just bring cartons to Jimmy, and he was smoking, you know, two and three packs a day, you know, which for someone who played as well as he did is extraordinary. Uh, but that's, you know, that's what really did him in. Yeah, he was 54 when he, no, 53 when he died. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? No? All right. Okay, yeah. To, uh, to end on a happier note, this is how they closed that show. Again, this was um, 
the New Year's Eve uh, episode. It aired on December 26th, 1953. So this is the, uh, the last piece that they played. Uh, it's a Charlie Shavers number called Puddle Lumps. Start it off. Blockbuster called Puddle Lump. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, I went a long time, didn't I? Before you won't leave, hold on, folks. Let me just let everybody know that our next meeting is going to be on February 21st, and it's going to be Christopher A. Brooks, who's the co-author with Richard Sims of Roland Hayes, The Legacy of an American Tenor, which was published by University of Indiana Press in 2014, and will offer an appreciation of Hayes' career and recordings. 
stay warm. Let's hope we don't get much snow over the weekend. And who knows what's going to happen tonight. But thanks again. See you next month.